so much to cover. It's brilliant to see so many people here. It's brilliant to talk about funding. That's brilliant. Um, my name is Jamie Kelsey Fry. I'm the contributing editor for New Internationalist magazine. Um, we covered fracking uh, in September last year. It's a good issue. And we actually started writing about fracking about three years ago. It was a small article when they first started linking, possibly, uh, you know, seismic events or earthquakes to start linking it to, to fracking. So I've, I've had an interest in it for quite a while. So a little bit of background is this isn't a debate and you need to know why. So originally we were advertised as a touring debate situation around the country. We chose the cities where we knew that there are a lot of licenses already there for fracking or unconventional coal, for gas and coal, for gas and oil. Um, because we thought it would be interesting to start trying to get the conversation going in those cities. We really respect the kind of small community groups that have absolutely started spraying out right across uh, Britain now. There's about 160 um, anti fracking groups. And we thought it would be interesting to bring that conversation into the urban centres and galvanise the conversation about it and galvanise support for those small groups. And we wanted to have a debate. That's pretty straightforward. You can't get a more balanced way of dealing with this than a, a table of three strong voices pro fracking, three strong voices against fracking. That was a fair way of doing it. So we set this whole thing up. And we invited all the strongest people from the pro fracking industry, from government, from DEC, from UCU, from Quadrilla, from DART, everybody. No show so far. No show so far at all. There's been one scientist who's a really respectable guy, Nick Riley, MPE, who's uh, just retired from uh, British, uh, was it British Geographical Survey, BGS. Uh, but apart from that, nobody else. Um, we're really pushing for London to still be a debate. In fact, the government keeps saying, we want to see more independent debate. So I actually went and spoke to Dan Byers in the E, who's the most, who's been saying that the most. And uh, he said, what a great opportunity, and all credit to him. He said, yes, that, that one in London sounds great. But since then, we've been either stonewalled or turned down. So I apologise if you came here to expect a debate tonight. And the situation is that this is going to be skewed because the people in our panel, and they're pretty good, I've got to say, but it is skewed. You're going to be hearing people saying why they think this is an incredibly bad decision. But the main portion of this evening will be for you to ask questions and challenge them, which is what it's... So we will have some kind of debate still going on. We really respect the people in the audience who are pro-fracking, particularly if they are able to actually ask those few questions that need to be answered. And to us, the most important people in the audience are the people who are undecided. Okay? In fact, if anyone has a companions who's undecided, you just put your hands up so they get an idea of who is still making their minds up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Brilliant. It's about ten every night, which is bloody marvellous, actually. Okay, um, so a lot of people want to know about who are we, who the hell is tall fracking, what's, what's the background, who's funding it. We've been in mean, we've got a tweet a while ago going, you're Richard, Bra you're Richard Branks is funding this. Or we've been told that our green piece is behind it, which obviously is quite predictable. Uh, no, we're not actually, but Joseph Conrad is behind it, so he's just going to tell you a little bit about what he is and why he's here and why he's helping us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Hi, yes, my name is Joseph Corey. Um, I'm the son of Vivian Westwood, who's sitting here in the front row. Um, I've spent most of my life in business. I started out helping my mother with her company. Um, I worked there for about 10 years. We started from one store and grew it up into quite a sizable industry. I then left that and started again from one store and built a brand called National Provocateur and over the course of about 12 years turned that into an international brand and then sold that about seven years ago and had nothing to do with it anymore. It makes, it makes me cringe a little bit every time I look at what they do now. Um, and then after that I started 
did a couple of other things. I have a makeup brand called Dilla Masca now, and um, I have a small clothing company that does special sort of one-off things. I also started a um, charitable foundation called Human Aid. Uh, that's spelled A D E on the end, reflectively humane, um, and that deals mostly with um, human rights abuses and also with sustainability projects. Uh, mostly in South America at the moment, where we try to um, find ways of sustainably growing things within degraded land um, uh, that's been slashed and burned from rainforest deforestation and sort of bringing that back into being productive land for feeding people and giving people food security. Um, so, Human Aid is the charity that's funding this show, this uh, campaign, this tour. Um, what's that got to do with human rights? Well, I think we all have the right to breathe fresh air, we all have the right to clean water, and we all have the right to uh, have children that have the possibility of a sustainable future. Um, as you will probably know, charities are not obliged to tell anybody uh, who donates to them, but for the sake of transparency, I can tell you that for this particular campaign, I have donated, my mother has donated, and a cosmetics company called Lush that you see on the high school. Um, so that's that, uh, just a bit of background to you know who I am, how we're funding this, everything's transparent, we're all above board, and you know what's going on. So, um, fracking. Eight or nine months ago, I knew nothing about fracking, or very little. Um, I bumped into Jamie, got me interested, I started doing my own research, and what I found was very shocking. Uh, right, so what did I find shocking? Well, um, from a small business perspective, um, I just wanted to give you this thought because I know we're going to hear a lot about. Its effects on health, its effects on the environment, on global <coughs> on jobs, on industry, and all the rest of it. But um, from a small business perspective, um, when I read the other day that um, legal in January come out with a report that says the property values within the radius, the two mile radius of the fracking site, are going to drop by 25 percent. Uh, the fact that uh, the insurance industry has recently been advised by an accurate that um, insurance will potentially not be available for properties within a fracking zone, and if it is, then the premiums are likely to rocket. Um, I just thought, well, hold on a minute. I mean, I've been in business all my life. I know very well that any kind of loan that you might have for a small family business when you're starting out is usually 99% of the time, as for other personal loans is normally secured against your property. What is your mortgage provider or your bank going to do when they realise that your property is actually worth 25% less than the money or the, than they thought it was and what's that going to mean for the loan that you might have made with them? What's it going to mean if you can't get insurance on your property? If you can't get insurance, you can't get mortgage, so what are the ripple effects that are going to happen to local economies and local communities in a fragile uh, situation that we have at the moment? So that's, that's kind of one angle I know where I'm coming from. And we need to really understand what that really means for the country as a whole um, as that starts to roll out. We need to know that the government is already in the process of or has licensed parts of up to 60, 65% of the country where they've identified there are fracking uh, shale gas reserves. Um, one of the questions that I have coming out of this is, I would like to understand from the small business uh, czar, uh, or minister, uh, secretary that works for the government, what plans are in place to ensure that people are protected from this devaluation, and that their businesses are protected, and their economies and their livelihoods are protected. And then the other thing I just want to leave you with before I pass you back is to just say that for me, this, all the detail about um, 
the damage that this may cause and the environmental impact is one thing. But for me, this is an issue about democracy as much as anything. We now understand that over 50% of the country, first of all, have never heard of fracking or know little to next to nothing about it. Of the other part of the country, it's pretty, it seems kind of evenly split between those that are against and those are for. And there's a hell of a lot of confusion within that mix between, when we, you know, we hear all these buzzwords like energy security, gold standard of regulation, uh, a bridge to renewable fuels, you know. But when you start to scratch the surface of some of those things, you know, a bridge to renewables, you start to discover, well, actually, it was the same terminology that the gas industry was using in the United States 40 years ago, and they are nowhere near any kind of energy security. They are nowhere near any kind of renewable target. So, anyway, without much further ado, um, I just want to say, you know, that the, gov the present government has no democratic mandate to be pushing this through. Um, they have no social license. Nobody voted for this. We have an election coming up in 10 months' time. Labour doesn't seem to know quite where it's at with regard to franking the Conservatives have made their position clear. You kid will kind of, uh, you know. <laughs> Yeah, right, so that's where we are. We have a situation now with a government consultation um, that's going on uh, over the next 12 weeks. It was just announced in the Queen's speech where they are going to be able to drill under your property and your home and there's going to be nothing you can do about it. So now is the time that we really need to talk about fracking. Okay, thank you. This is 
similar to every other city, by the way. This was the generally that was the reaction we get on the streets when we went to. Or that Glasgow, people in the streets of Glasgow were really bloody funny, they were really, really funny people. <laughs> Not the Swansea, just have a great sense of humour too, but <laughs> they were right out there in Glasgow, they're brilliant. Um, so let's take a look at the audience who are undecided. And it's easy that have meetings like this, of course, remember this was going to be a debate, but it's easy to assume that we're well, okay, that we all know the basics. We don't, okay, ten people in the group don't. So we chose the most unbiased film we could find that's really clear and simple, describing what hydraulic fracturing basically is. Okay? So uh, we can watch that now, so at least everyone in the room is on the same page with the industry we're talking about. Okay? It's hydraulic fracturing or fracking. Since the Industrial Revolution, our energy consumption has risen unceasingly. The majority of this energy consumption is supplied by fossil fuels like coal or natural gas. Recently, there's been a lot of talk about a controversial method of extracting natural gas, hydraulic fracturing, or fracking. Put simply, fracking describes the recovery of natural gas from deep layers inside the earth. In this method, porous rock is fractured by the use of water, sand, and chemicals in order to release the enclosed natural gas. The technique of fracking has been known since the 1940s. Nonetheless, only in the last 10 years has there been quite a fracking boom, especially in the USA. This is because most conventional natural gas sources in America and on the European continent have been exhausted. Thus, prices for natural gas and other fuels are rising steadily. Significantly more complicated and expensive methods, like fracking, have now become attractive and profitable. In the meantime, fracking has already been used more than a million times in the USA alone. Over 60% of all new oil and gas wells are drilled by using fracking. Now, let's take a look at how fracking actually works. First, a shaft is drilled several hundred meters into the earth. From there, a horizontal hole is drilled into the gas bearing layer of rock. Next, the fracking fluid is pumped into the ground using high performance pumps. On average, the fluid consists of 8 million litres of water, which amounts to about the daily consumption of 65,000 people, plus several thousand tons of sand and about 200,000 litres of chemicals. The mixture penetrates into the rock layer and produces innumerable tiny cracks. The sand prevents the cracks from closing again. The chemicals perform various tasks. Among other things, they compress the water, kill off bacteria, or dissolve minerals. Next, the majority of the fracking fluid is pumped out again. And now the natural gas can be recovered. As soon as the gas source is exhausted, the drill hole is sealed. As a rule, the fracking fluid is pumped back into deep underground layers and sealed in there. However, fracking is also associated with several considerable risks. The primary risk consists in the contamination of drinking water sources. Fracking not only consumes large quantities of fresh water, but in addition the water is subsequently contaminated and is highly toxic. The contamination is so severe that the water cannot even be cleaned in a treatment plant. Even though the danger is known and theoretically could be managed, in the USA already, sources have been contaminated due to negligence. No one yet knows how the enclosed water will behave in the future, since there have not yet been any long-term studies on the subject. The chemicals used in fracking vary from the hazardous to the extremely toxic and carcinogenic, such as benzoyl or formic acid. The companies using fracking say nothing about the precise composition of the chemical mixture. But it is known that there are about 700 different chemical agents which can be used in the process. Another risk is the release of greenhouse gases. The natural gas recovered by fracking consists largely of methane, a greenhouse gas which is 25 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Natural gas is less harmful than coal when burnt. But nonetheless, the negative effects of fracking on the climate balance are overall greater. Firstly, the fracking process requires a very large consumption of energy. Secondly, the drill holes are quickly exhausted 
and it's necessary to drill fracking holes much more frequently than for classical natural gas wells. In addition, about 3% of the recovered gas is lost in the extraction and escapes into the atmosphere. So how is fracking and its expected benefits to be assessed when the advantages are balanced against the disadvantages? When properly employed, this technique offers one way in the short to medium term to meet our demand for lower cost energy. But the long term consequences of fracking are unforeseeable, and the risk to our drinking water thus should not be underestimated. Thank you. 
please plug them for more information. And also, obviously, with Keith um, and Andy, you're going to hear from them. They are very strong in the uh, local movement. So if you want to become interested in supporting them, here they are. Okay, so uh, Andy Chiba um, from Fratley Wales, local community organiser, has become a sort of floating consultant as a geology background, and he's able to kind of go around and help local communities organise their groups, giving the kind of information that's really important for them to have. Um, and of course, it's only got a minute, but there's loads of them. Once the Q&A start happening, you'll hear a lot more from these fantastic people. Okay, uh, okay thanks uh, for asking me on tonight. I'm here presenting Traffic Wales, as I say, as a sort of lovely uh, consultant. I've got a geology and geography background, 20 years teaching experience. And uh, basically, I, I was the guy who represented the Bible Says Diving public inquiry uh, into the Landau testing application. So far, the only public inquiry into a testing application anywhere in the UK, as far as I'm aware. Um, now, in my role with Factory Wales, uh, I do go out and try and support them with the sort of technical um, expertise in terms of the geology and planning issues. Uh, and Factory Wales is very much there as a support organisation. Um, basically, we look to disseminate information um, to help inform groups, also disseminate information about events and meetings and so on. And also uh, help organise training events. So, for example, last Saturday in Land Tristan, there was what we call a fraction training event, um, which basically broke down into two parts in the morning session. Uh, we focused on basically planning and getting together the ideas behind setting up our own community protection camps. And you're know, probably familiar with that concept of Balkan and Vasa uh, well, Yeah, As and when the individuals do turn up in, in South Wales, we are now on a, on a sort of ready footing, if you like, or very close to ready footings so that we can uh, basically meet them when they arrive almost. Um, the second part of the event was also so to do with the legal aspects of getting involved in direct action. Most of the people involved in this campaign have little or no previous experience of direct action activity, and therefore we feel it's important that people go in with their eyes open. So we had a whole training session, basically letting them know what their rights and responsibilities are as citizens, and what to do if, if, if things happen, like getting arrested and that sort of thing, which some quite famous people have, have had happen to them quite recently. Um, so basically we, we reach out, support those groups, I'm more than happy to travel anywhere uh, around South Wales in particular to, to uh, be present at meetings and provide that sort of support. Um, so make sure you visit the Factory uh, Wales website, uh, from there you can sign up for the sort of newsletter which will keep you well informed of everything that's going on like subsequent training events and, and, and so on. And, you know, basically, if you, as Jamie says, we're going to be hanging around at the end, so feel free to come and, and see me so you can find out where your local group is. If you've been to Swansea area, this is the man. Uh, but if, you, if you're coming a bit further afield, I know some people come further afield, I can point you to, towards your nearest group. And if there isn't one, I can help you set one up. Okay. So I uh, hope to speak to you all later about that. Thank you. So we now have the opportunity to hear from Elizabeth Arnold from Pennsylvania. And she's going to be talking from the perspective of you know, an ordinary human being, an electrician, just from a normal background, who can tell you exactly what it is in reality. Um, but it goes on for a long period of time, otherwise. Okay? So, Liz, uh, you've got three minutes, then you've got to fill it, you've got one and a half minutes. All right, this is our fourth night, so I should be a little speedier, but if I talk too fast, just let me know. Um, my name is Liz Arnold. I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And thankfully, Philadelphia does not 
sit atop a shale layer, um, but most of the rest of our state does, and currently we are up to about 9,000 fracked wells in Pennsylvania, covering 60% of the state. And I have to say, looking at this, it makes me just want to cry because, because I know what's in store for you all, and I just, I just hope, I hope you are as successful as it seems you will be because you don't want any, any part of this. It has been a nightmare for Pennsylvania, and I cannot, really anything I say that sounds exaggerated is an understatement because we have had so many families um, still in Pennsylvania living without water that they can drink or cook with or bake with or even give to their animals. Um, we've seen tons of dead cattle, goats, cows, but also the animals that nobody accounts for. Um, the raccoons, the possums, the deer, the fish. Um, you know, people walking through their property will just find every animal that they previously saw alive trotting through their property just dead, you know, in the bushes or under the tree. Um, we've, even in cases where water has not become contaminated immediately, um, we, there's, you know, they flare this gas off. So when they frack a well, they flare the gas, one, to test it, two, to let off the pressure because there's so much gas coming out at once. And this is like noxious, noxious stuff. So we've had families that, um, I'll just go through a quick list of the health symptoms because there's a lot and there's only three minutes. So some of the health symptoms include rashes from bathing in the water, um, nose bleeds, neurological issues, memory loss, disorientation, constant ringing in the ears, nausea, uh, swollen organs. So if you're drinking contaminated water, basically anything that's going through you, that it, you know, anything in you that the water is touching as it goes through you is which are pretty much all your organs. Um, people have had a lot of bladder issues, tumors, um, oh Lord, what else, asthma, you know, lung respiratory issues. And now um, we're seeing cancer pockets. And our state has been incredibly irresponsible and irresponsive. The government has not, um, has really not even bothered to investigate most people's claims, in some cases they have, and have literally lied to people about whether their water's been contaminated. And when people get third party um, testing done of their water and say, hey, this list of, of like 20 toxic chemicals that's in my water that wasn't there when I tested it when this well was drilled, and now after they started fracking it's in my water, this seems pretty conclusive. The state's like, yeah, and sometimes they'll come back and say, yeah, actually the water is contaminated, don't drink that. And meanwhile, you know, they, they were told they could drink it for the past nine months. You know, I mean, this is really criminal, what's going on in Pennsylvania. Um, but I, I also want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the, the claims of, oh, but, oh, but, you know, that's just a couple of farmers in rural Pennsylvania, you know, who really cares about those people anyway? You know, they don't live in the city, so they don't really count. And, you know, well, one, obviously, I'm sure you empathetic people understand that nobody should be, a, really no part of the country should be a sacrifice zone. Everybody matters equally. Whether, you know, your population density shouldn't dictate the value of your life. And, but, you know, being from the city, what we're concerned about in Philadelphia is, is that upstream from us they want to drill, which then contaminates our water supply. So we fought that, and because we're privileged to have, you know, we're privileged with more resources and a larger population base, we've been successful in fighting the drilling in our watershed. So currently they've done some test drilling and they want to put a pipeline under our river, but they, we've staved off um, the fracking that's going on in the rest of the state. But it's not a temporary, it, I mean, sorry, it's a temporary thing, it's not a permanent ban. So we're still fighting for a permanent ban and we're still fighting for the rest of the state because the gas industry wants to put 100,000 wells in Pennsylvania. So they've just gotten started and we plan on making sure they don't ever finish with what they plan to do with our state. Um, and it's not just Pennsylvania, it's the rest of the country as well. Anywhere where you find shale, they're trying to frack. Um, they started fracking before us out west in Texas and Wyoming. Um, they're 
fracking in dozens, uh, dozens of states now. Um, but what we see in all of Pennsylvania is the build out of the infrastructure. So it doesn't matter if you don't live above a shale uh, layer, they will build a pipeline in your backyard. They'll build a compressor station, which if you live on a runway where there's ginormous jet planes taking off, and landing constantly, then you understand what it's like to live near a compressor station. Because it's really, really, really loud. It sounds like a jet engine constantly. And, and it's noxious. It's also letting off noxious gas. The compressor station is used to move the gas through the pipeline. So it presses it on through the pipeline. Um, and they are also trying to build Philadelphia out as a fracked gas hub. Um, so really now everywhere in Pennsylvania, whether you're directly above the shale or not, we're feeling the impacts, and all of us now feel like frontline communities. Um, so, Pennsylvania is just slightly smaller than England, to give you a sense of what you could be facing here. Um, but, so that's a, that's a little bit about what's going on in Pennsylvania, but I want to show a video of um, a farmer from Pennsylvania who lost, uh, whose water went bad, who lost cattle, and these are, these are, this is just a, two-minute clip of what's happened to him in his own words. He has a bit of a thick American accent, so... Yeah, just, just try it. My name is Terry Gregory. I live in western Pennsylvania, southwest of Pennsylvania, Washington now. I'm 68 years old. We bought in 1988. Uh, the gas company, we, did, we had leased to come with the property. But the 60 acres did not have no gas going on. We had two springs, a well, and a pond for the cattle. So it was spring and the pond was for the cattle. So in 2007, the gas company came and said, We're drilling two wells on your property. I said, Go on the old rest of the farm and drill someplace else. Well, they said, We're going to drill two. So 2008, they come on our property. And this was an old lease from 1921. They come on our property. Drove so two vertical wells, 450 feet from our drinking water, and the other the well on the top of it was a thousand feet from the house. It, it, it ruined all our property in that. Uh, within 30 days of the first well being drilled, our water, our water come out of the spigot just like Dimmick's water, like I see what it looked like. That's what it come out of the spigot. So it started breaking out of the drinking water. And then February, when I lost all the cattle, they had a blowout and all the water from the frack stuff was running into the pasture into the point where the cattle drank. And I had 19 head of cattle and in 2008, so two and a half months later, my cows were having calves, I lost 10 calves, uh, 19 cows that were still born in the two-year-old cows. And I called the DEP, called the gas company, and the DEP did not do nothing. They said that's a farmer's law. And refused to do anything about it. Nobody has done nothing about it since. I've had nothing but trouble with my cattle. But this old lease, it don't matter if it's a new lease, an old lease, once they're on your property, they're going to do what they want to do. So we have a water buffalo, 2,000 gallon water buffalo, which holds 2,000 gallons of water every four days. The, the gas company has somebody coming in, bringing 2,000 gallons of temporary water for our cattle. And that's all we have on our property now. Water dispenser, which we pay eight hundred dollars, ready eight hundred dollars a year since two thousand nine for drinking water. So everybody thinks you're going to get rich, not going to get rich on it because it costs you more in the end. Yeah, they're the only ones that's making the money. So you don't want them to come into New York because they're going to do the same thing. They can ruin sixty acres. They're and with the pond and springs, they're going to ruin big bodies of water up here. So you better off to keep them out of the state. And water is more important than gas. You don't need the gas, but you need the water. And that's the most, most important. Once you drink the water, you don't have nothing left. Thank you. Think? So, those, uh, that, so that's Terry Greenwood speaking at a, um, a conference, a press conference in New York. Um, because New York, they have also, um, they also want to frack New York. And New York has been successful thus far in um, having a temporary, winning a temporary moratorium for their state. So they still have, uh, they're still dumping fracked wastewater from Pennsylvania into wells in New 
York and Ohio, and they're trucking our waste all over the country, as well as dumping it in the middle of the night, and now so brazenly in the middle of the day um, on our roads, in our fields, in our streams. A couple of years ago, before people really knew what was going on, they were actually trucking it straight to the municipal water treatment facilities. And when people found out what fracking was and what, what some of the stuff that's in the fracking fluid, you know, but people spoke out and they had to stop trucking it to the municipal water supplies. But how many people drink that water before they even realized what was going on? Um, naturally occurring in the layer of, uh, in the shale layer is also radioactive materials. So we're not just talking about the hundreds of carcinogens and neurotoxins that are part of the special frac fluid cocktail that they use to help get the gas out. But um, up with the fluid that comes back after you frack is um, also radioactive material. So um, Terry actually, not so long ago, um, came down with a rare form of brain cancer, uh, as did seven of his neighbors in this rural area of Pennsylvania. They all have this same rare form of brain cancer at the same time. Um, and Terry actually just passed away on Monday. Um, from his cancer. So, dedicating uh, the tour to Terry and all other families that still don't have water. Um, his wife still lives on the property because their property is worth nothing, so they haven't been able to sell it. Um, but we, you know, the anti fracking movement we're fighting in Pennsylvania, we're fighting the onslaught of new infrastructure projects and new wells, but we're also doing a lot of, um, you know, aid to, to families that are. Which is growing in number by the day. So that's a little what's going on in Pennsylvania, and I really, really hope, hope for y'all sake that you never have to deal with this here. Ever. Three hundred and twenty pounds. Three hundred and twelve quid. So, you know, let me, <laughs> oh, they see what we're doing. Something like Lucy. Like, that's, that's how we think of keeping our shit together. We keep so, Lucy. Like um, anyway, they raised a lot of money last night. So it's Lucy, obviously, knows that family. So, you know, the funeral is tomorrow. Is that right? Yeah. Anyway, um, we're going to move fast, folks. Uh, down the last two, the last three people, because um, we need to have a lot of time for questions as well. Okay. So. The, Bloody marvellous, Paul Moss. He's, for people who are going to be looking into this industry and this controversy already, Paul is an absolute godsend for us. He's a sort of all rounder. He's, he's a, he calls himself actually an ecological futurologist, which is a hell of a title. Imagine being somewhere in the park and you just have to do, be polite and say, hey, what to do for a living? <laughs> My God! But he's brilliant, genuinely, genuinely brilliant. So it's a pleasure <laughs> to bring it over to Paul. He's got a 10 minute presentation, um, which is incredibly informative. Hello, everybody. Am I on? Right. Um, oh, no, no, where should I start? Uh, this picture is about six miles west of where I live in Banbury. Um, if the Pennines are the backbone of Britain, then this is the number vertebrae. Uh, that's six miles west of Banbury. Everything to the left of that picture drains into the River Thames and ends up in the Thames Estuary. Everything to the right of that picture drains into the River Avon and then into the River Severn. So it really is on the sort of the real centre of, of, of England, and uh, they want to set fire to the cold seas under there. Same as the Lower Estuary, same as Cardiff Bay, the British Geological Survey has identified that as one of the areas they want to set fire to. So all over the country we are faced uh, with this area of problems. Apologies, I'm reading the video as well. Um, the yellow bits, where they've already issued licenses, most of those licenses were issued in 2008 and the what's called the 13th grade. Yeah. So places like Lancashire, uh, bits of East Midlands, that sort of thing. And the blue area is the 14th round. Now 
the 14th round actually started right back in 2010. Um, I had an email from a friend in Pennsylvania um, back in 2008 saying, we really should look at this. And I said, well, yeah, okay. It, I started working on this in 2009 and I haven't stopped. I've just been at it and at it and at it down in the country. And this was supposed to be announced at the beginning of 2012. They didn't have the uh, they got a bit panicky. It was supposed to be announced at the beginning of this year, then it was supposed to be announced at the beginning of this month, but we had some road election results. Now, it might be the beginning of July they announced it, but potentially the whole of the blue area could go, uh, which includes some quite big areas around here. Uh, the greenest circles are where we already have onshore oil and gas production. Uh, which farm down in Dorset is the biggest onshore oil field in Europe? It's quite significant, but these are conventional. So one well at which farm, oil well, or one gas well at Rydale in the Yorkshire, the Yorkshire North York Water Park um, are equivalent to 80 to 100 unconventional wells. That's why unconventional gas has a much bigger impact than conventional, because you need so many more wells. So you're multiplying all those emissions, you're multiplying the energy, the chemicals, and that's why it has a bigger impact. Where the red circle is where we're probably going to see most of the development. Now, at Falkirk in Scotland, it's red and yellow because they have a public inquiry there. The results of that public inquiry come out at the beginning of August. And pretty much going to define what happens next. If they lose, it'll be quite interesting. If they win, uh, the Scottish government isn't that favourable, then we might have problems. Lancashire is the, probably the first area in England which is going to see shale gas production. But the other red circles, one of which is South Wales, are likely to be where we see the initial phase of development. Now, anyone in that blue area, they might want to develop. But what they go for first is the sweet spots, the bits that have the biggest oomph to get the biggest return for their buck. And that South Wales, the marshes from Oswestry up to Liverpool, Lancashire, the East Midlands, and possibly for shale oil around Sussex and Surrey. Uh, Lord Howell talks about the desolate north, I like to talk about the verdant south. Um, so that's, that's probably that bit. Next. Two grey areas, because they're geologically very difficult, the Mendips, there's a potential there, but they could do a lot of damage. And in Kent, uh, they've already tried an application in Kent for drilling, but there's an aquifer that supplies 90% of all Kent's drinking water, just above it, and they haven't been able to prove that it will be safe enough to do, so they, they withdrew the application. The government's case rests on uh, various reports, but there are three main reports. The first one is the British Geological Survey study of the bone and share, which I won't go into. But they basically say there's all this gas available. If you look at the figures, do some expert analysis, it isn't. We might get one or two percent of what the government say at the end of the day. This is one of the others. Uh, came out last September. Potential greenhouse gas emissions associated with shale gas extraction and use. This was the government's little report basically saying the emissions from shale gas are the same as they are for ordinary gas and therefore it's all fine and dandy and you can convert from one to the other. What the report actually says is in the absence of information about the quality of UK shale gas, we have assumed that shale gas would produce similar emissions to those in the production process and the conventional gas. The government's position isn't based on evidence, it's based on an assumption that it will be the same. What they did do in their calculations, they assumed what the emissions would be, and then divided that by the amount of gas produced to produce a number, which would be how much pollution in the unit of gas in order to compare it to all the other options. The amount of emissions was perhaps half of what we might expect. There's been a lot of work in America recently, they've been flying aircraft over the top of production sites, and they're monitoring two to eight times more emissions than the industry say they're emitting. They then divide that figure by the amount of gas produced, and the figure that they're using in this report is twice 
what the figures in America are for what each well on average produces. So if you take a smaller figure divided by a bigger figure, you get a very low number. In actuality, if you re reproduce their model, put the real figures in, shale gas in Britain will be as bad as burning coal. On a 100 year timeline. On a 25 year timeline, it's two, two and a half times worse than burning coal. And the short timeline is very important. That's mostly because of methane emissions. And as we're so close to carbon tipping points, we don't want to be emitting lots of methane, which is a very powerful driving effect on greenhouse uh, gases. So, um, the government's whole case on carbon just doesn't work. It's, it's full of holes. The other report that came out in October of last year, which was actually a draft for comment, even though various people talk about it as if it's the real final report. Uh, in view of the potential public health impacts and exposure to the chemical and radioactive pollutants as a result of shale gas extraction. Um, this was awful. Uh, I wrote 95 pages with 200 academic references about this. Um, it, I won't go through that. What it basically says is, uh, currently available evidence indicates that potential risks to public health from exposure to the emissions associated with shower gas extraction are low if the operations are properly run and regulated. That is what's called a logical tautology. It's true for every condition it applies to. So, if it all goes wrong, it wasn't properly regulated, therefore they're still correct. And this is the problem. Uh, whenever you ask, it's basically, it will be fine if it's properly been regulated. But nowhere where we've done this in the world, in Australia, where New South Wales government has just suspended every licence and all the review. In Canada, where the National Body of Canadian Scientists and the New Brunswick and British Columbia uh, health people have just come out and said, we don't know what the effects are, we've really got to stop doing this. Yeah. By and large, the scientific community is saying, we don't know. We know there's a big effect, we just don't know how big it is, where it is, and what we can do about it. Yeah. For me, this all really starts with a speech that David Cameron gave to the CDI back in November 2012. Uh, I won't go into all of it, but basically he said, in a much nicer accent, uh, government can be far too slow at getting stuff I'm determined to change this. Here's how. Cutting back on judicial reviews. Judicial reviews when the public are able to take the government to court. They've made it ten times harder to get a judicial review and ten times more expensive. Some of the campaign groups who've had judicial reviews have stopped them because they're afraid of the costs. So it's had a chilling effect on our democracy because we are not able to hold the government to account. Then he said reducing government consultations. Absolutely. You're quite lucky in Wales that planning is a devolved power. In England, they've imposed a set of uh, guidelines for planning on onshore oil and gas without any consultation whatsoever. In Wales, you've yet to catch up with that, but very soon, the Welsh Assembly are going to have to come up with some guidelines for this. Streamlining European legislation. Basically, they're going through all legislation with a fine tooth comb and trying to get rid of it. They might have heard of the bomb file of the Prangos. They've got rid of a lot of Prangos. The big one is they've gone to the Environment Protection Agency in uh, Natural Wales and basically said, you've got to give permits for these processes in two weeks. Not 13 weeks, two weeks. How are you going to consult the public, let alone do a proper review of the impacts in two weeks? Stopping the gold plated coal plating legislation at home. What they basically mean is we're going to take all our legislation and we're going to get rid of the bits that stop us doing stuff because we don't like them. Now, the last time we did this was in the 1980s during the Thatcher period. One of the things they got rid of were the restrictions on the recycling of meat, bone meal to animal feed. The result of that was BSE. So all we're doing is repeating what was done 30 years ago and we know the effects will be bad. Not just the fracking, but actually quite a few other bits of public policy too. And Cameron concluded, well, this country is the economic equivalent of war today. We need the same spirit. We need to forget about crossing every T and dotting every I. We need to throw everything we've got to winning this global race. <laughs> what? <laughs> what we need is jobs, decent standards of living, housing, and none of the government's policies do that. And fracking will not solve that problem. It all rests on three.
three basic things. Energy security, prices, and what that means to the economy. Energy security, fracking will never stop us importing gas. That's partly because it produces too little, but mainly North Sea is still contracting 15% a year. And if we've got it 10 or 15 years, fracking will make no difference. We'll still be importing. Prices, if you notice in the last year, the government started being very quiet about prices. That's because even the experts on their side can't say it's going to reduce prices. The United States Energy Information Agency, in their report last year, actually said gas prices in America are going to have to double because shale gas is more expensive to produce. So it's not going to reduce prices. And think about that contract they signed for the, Hebe, the new HPC nuclear reactor, the BDF. Twice the price of electricity it is today. Unfortunately, the media don't do exponential mathematics. Um, if you increase electricity prices at 7 or 8% per year, for the next 10 years when it's due to open, they will be twice what they are today. All the government did when signing that contract was accepting that's the future. And that means the economy is going to get no better. We've had an economy that has been built for the last 100, 150 years on cheap fuel and cheap resources. And we don't have that anymore. And the reason we don't have that is because it's running out. We've had the easy to get stuff, and now the easy to get stuff is hitting the buffers. We're going for the harder to get stuff. And it's not going to solve the problem because we can pump every last drop of fossil fuels, and it's not going to make the economy any better. What we need is change. We need a different economic policy, we need to reflect these ecological limits. And then we can start tackling some of these basic problems between what our society requires and the impacts that has on the environment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we have two more panelists who are going to speak briefly, and then it's over to you. Uh, so next is uh, Tom Barlow, who's been travelling with us. He works for, uh, well, he's a member of Reclaim the Power, and he's just going to just do two minutes, okay? It's got to be just two minutes, because I'm on a lot of time for the audience. Um, talking about the uh, jobs and economy side of the space. So jobs, obviously, is something that we hear a lot about. It's going to be a lot of jobs created. Okay, so, off you go. Hello, Tom B. Nice to see you all. Um, I'm from Manchester, and I think you know Manchester is in a similar position to Swansea, to pretty much everywhere outside of London and the South East. It's hard times, you know, it's not easy times. Um, we'd all like to see jobs, we'd quite like to see energy security, and we'd definitely like to see cheaper fuel bills. You know, that, that's something that for us might mitigate the health concerns, the environmental concerns. You know, maybe we've got jobs and security. Uh, that would be okay. We could we could live with that. So I had a look at these uh, these claims. And first off, we have to start with fuel bills. And we know now, Lord Brown, who's the head of Quadrilla, Lord in the UK, and George Osborne have all admitted openly. And Lord Brown said this very specifically: fuel bills will not go down because of fracked gas. Okay. But what we do know is that they will continue to go up because if we continue to build a gas infrastructure, we will continue to leave a monopoly of energy power within the big six. The big six energy companies who've raised fuel bills 20% year on year despite increasing energy prices for them. Okay? This is our energy future if we go with fracked gas. If we look at energy independence and say we don't want to rely on Russia, well, you know, for starters, we don't. But yeah, it would be nice, maybe it would be nice to have energy independence. But, uh, you know, it will take at least a decade, and again, this is according to Lord Brown, head of Quadrilla, before we can industrialise this process, okay, until we can produce the amount that we want. And according to the British Geological Society, if we get 10%, that will last for 20 months worth of energy. We are more likely to get 1 to 3%, 2 to 6 months worth of energy. This is not going to give us energy independence. And again, it plays into the hands of the big six, the very big six who last year said that they would turn the lights out if we capped fuel prices. Okay? So is that energy security? I don't think so. Okay? And then we look at jobs. The government report, the AMEC report, says there's five to 32,000 jobs potentially available. 
like potentially available. This was released in January, yet they're going around saying there's 74,000 jobs, whatever. There's five to 50,000 jobs. And again, this comes during a period of peak production for two years in around a decade's time. Because you go, you set up a well, you leave. We don't have the skills, so most of the jobs will not go to British workers. And at the same time, we end up uh, destroying industries like agriculture because of all the water we take, tourism, and we also destroy small businesses. Okay, there is no cost-benefit analysis. But we know that we insulate our houses and we build renewable energy. We can cheapen our fuel bills, we can create jobs, and we can create energy independence, and we can do that right here, right now. If we meet our climate targets by 2020, we will be 65% less dependent on foreign oil and gas. That's within five years. That's all we've got to try and aim to do. We can start doing this now. Okay. This is a false solution to a false problem. Thank you. So over to uh, another of our family who's doing all the bus and doing pretty well by doing so. Um, some of you may know Tina Louise already uh, from RAF. Um, it's only going to be a minute there. I'm going to do a minute. There's going to be a lot of stuff you're going to say later. Cheers. Okay. Hi, Tina Louise Rothery. I'm with a group called Residence Action on Farm Fracking. We're based in and around the Blackpool area. Blackpool, as you may know, in 2011 is the only place in the country to have had a high volume hydraulic fracture in the as a result of that, we had two seismic occurrences. It took Quadrilla six months to admit they did that. They kept denying that there was seismic activity right around the well, around the time of fracking, had anything to do with them. And yet they're in our community asking us to trust them. We didn't trust them and we read the brochure and we found that there were seven points in the brochure we could take to the Advertising Standards Authority of overstating safety claims. When someone looking to do a dangerous process comes to your community, makes a mistake, does not admit that mistake, and then lies about how incredibly safe it's going to be, would you do business with them? And they're asking us to do that. I came to this as a grandmother, not as anyone with any expertise. And I have now spent two and a half years with my head knee deep in this subject. It's not a happy place. It's horrible. And I think that when we do these meetings, and we did these in Blackpool, we were two little groups two and a half years ago. We are 17 groups strong in the Bar Coast area alone. Countrywide, we started out as four groups. We're now 180 groups. Everywhere we go with a public meeting and we tell people about it, a new group starts. And it starts because it's self-defense. We're not getting the help we want. Where are they? Why, in two and a half years, will no one answer our questions? They're simple questions requiring simple answers. But the government wants you to read report after report after report. The current planning application for us is 1,500 pages long. And they're going to sneak that through, hoping we won't pay attention. I would just encourage you to awaken your inner activist, self-empower, defend your community. So uh, the last time it was uh, people's blood was running very high in Manchester, Barn and Boston, South Exploratory, Julian going on there. So a lot of people when it came to this section were not asking questions, they were angry and they were standing up and they were saying coming support. Put off, put off a lot of people. Um, and you know for us the people we care about the most of them are the ten undecided people. So please do just ask questions. Okay, please do just ask questions. So, uh, let's have a question. Okay. So there's three gentlemen just here in the middle. Thank you very much, Lucy. Can you start with your three minutes? So there's a gentleman here. One quick question to Keith or uh, Paul. Can you reiterate that uh, Lava Lava Esprit will be gasified and not fracked? Because I, I need to be able to reiterate that to somebody. I think you, Paul, said a while ago. Thank you. Uh, for years in uh, the UK, we have enjoyed the quality of water, which is supposed to be wholesome and pure. 
you work, you live in by the water company, so that is a legal position. Could I just ask you uh, if what's the white scenario about the pollution of uh, water contamination, of where the water companies would stand in this, if there was some um, legal redress back to the community because no longer would they be able to enjoy quality of water that we've already that we've always expected. And just the second question I really quickly is about this buying off in the community. Um, when they're coming in, your opinion about this, where they're putting money into the community, the local foot club is trying to spin the community up by buying that. And I think that's a dreadful position yes. where it's going to spin the community up. So I think we're all going to stay united on this as communities. Thank you. Absolutely. I want to do that. I want to ask the question, what does it tell us about the state of our democracy? Exactly. Well, on one side, on the pro-fracking side, we've got uh, energy corporations, drilling companies, service corporations, the banking, banking system funding these absentee landlords, and uh, a Tory-led you know, coalition, uh, aided in some cases by a very lax local uh, authority. And uh, I want to know what, what do you think of the state, state of democracy? And on the other side, of course, we've just got the, basically the 99%, the rest of us. Thank you, great. So, really great. It's three questions to start off with. I really appreciate it. So, um, with that first question, Keith, perhaps you can answer that. And that's the actual nature of, of the project. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I can confirm absolutely that what's planned in the Lucker Estuary is underground coal gasification. Uh, and for reasons of the Evening Post, I've got a letter in the Evening Post about that, where I've made it clear to people that underground coal gasification is a different process to fracking and shale gas and coal bed methane. It doesn't involve fracking. Arguably worse, though. But that doesn't mean it's safe. It's just a different way of trashing our environment. Okay. Thank you. And uh, this actually, the second part of this gentleman's question was about the true nature of has America been making a profit out of it as it actually benefits economically? Um, um, about, about half of the wells are actually an economic loss for the companies, and the large companies have actually, most of the large companies, BP, Shell, have actually written off over a billion dollars in losses in the shale fields in the US. Um, if you read the Wall Street Journal, they're a total, they just print um, PR releases, press releases from the gas industry. So if you would think it was a good investment, but a lot of investors have found that it's been a very bad investment for them. And a lot of the companies still drilling in the US are mostly mid to small size companies that are what are considered wildcatters. And a lot of them actually just go bankrupt overnight. So then you have that issue. You talked about you know what kind of accountability is there. We have a right to clean water. First, there's actually, we actually don't have any technology that's within a, a affordability to clean this, this stuff, the, the flow back fluid. So once it's contaminated, it doesn't matter what you have on paper, they're not going to clean it up. And two, um, when they go bankrupt overnight, there is no way to hold them accountable. And Wyoming is experiencing, experiencing that. Many, many of the states in the US, um, really all of them are experiencing that, that these companies go bankrupt overnight. They don't even cap or plug the wells, and then the state is left with the cost um, of of just plugging them, and that's plugging them is just the most basic thing you can do. That's not ensuring that it's actually going to be safe or prevent it from leaking. Okay, thanks. Also, the as well. Also, some advice this thing. Yeah. Um, underground coal gasification. Well, my son always says to me, "Giggle, setting fire to coal seams underground." They tried this in Britain in the 1950s. There was a parliamentary debate because they tried to get 10 miles from Kidminster, and in Kidminster people couldn't stand the smell, so they killed it dead. Uh, they tried it in America in the 70s and gave up. The most recent trials were three sites in Queensland in Australia. One is closed, one company has been taken to court and fined, and the other is in, in court right now for putting benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene into the local groundwater. So it does not work. And if you look at the geological section of the Lugger Estuary, there is a geological fault running right through the middle which connects the water to the coal seams concerned. It's the stupidest place to possibly do it. Profitability, uh, the Oxford Institute for 
theology studies. They are not hippies. Um, <laughs> they, they brought out a report in March which put the total losses, from not just the direct industry, but the finance industry in America, at $35 billion. That's a bit more than J.P. Morgan's bank bailout and a bit less than Citigroup's. Water quality, we will not drink bad water. The, the, the law requires that we drink clean water. What will happen is we will pay for that. So at the moment, the government's own research says we're paying a billion pounds in this country to clean up after farmers. Taking the pesticides out of the water, storing water, getting the sediment out of the waterways to stop flooding. If they pollute the water, then we will pay because the government isn't requiring strict liability if they cause any problems. Buying off the council isn't democracy. Um, the government is starving councils of money at the same time as they're saying, hey, you can get $10,000 uh, 10, per pad. Now this is the thing, Quadrilla in Lancashire are offering £10,000 per well. The rest of the industry is only offering it per pad. So even the industry has not got a consistent position on this. Do you want to but, clarify a pad is 10 wells? Yeah, it Most people don't know that. Wells. But the thing is that the environment agency is going to have to spend a lot of money in order to police these sites and do all these applications and do all the work. Local authorities are going to have to spend money monitoring your air and water quality to make sure it's okay. So are we just going to burn all the money they give going around monitoring them and tidying up after them? Nobody's actually specified how we will recover the costs of regulating them from the industry. It might just be that that's what the money is. Okay. And uh, how do you I'd just like to pick up on two points here. One about uh, the water resources, particularly in Wales, because in the public inquiry we had in Landau, we engaged with Welsh Water and Dua Cymru about the situation there. And of course, Dua Cymru is a private company these days, right? it's not in public hands. And at the moment, they, they, they actually draw very little drinking water from any aquifers in South Wales. Mostly it comes from the reservoirs and so on to the, to the north of Cardiff and so on. So, on that level, they don't really give us stuff about uh, the aquifers because it's not part of their business plan. Right? Having said that, they do acknowledge quite openly that it is a key resource for the future. Right? And on top of that, of course, although they don't draw water from it, a lot of local farmers and other businesses do draw water from it, from, from boreholes on their land for cattle and, 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 and irrigation and so on. So, you know, there's serious questions about the accountability of, of Welsh water from that point of view. Um, and I'll second, and as they said as well, of course, if things go wrong, they can just go bank up and walk away, and that's the way it works. Right? And in terms of the economics of it, that someone else was talking about, I'd just like to add the point that uh, the economics are basically very, very dodgy indeed. It's basically a glorified Ponzi scheme. You can go on uh, YouTube and if you just Google um, fracking Ponzi scheme, it explains it far better than I can in 30 seconds. Uh, but basically, if you look at the one of the big key local players, it's a company called Coast Oil and Gas. Sounds very grand. They're a tin pot company, based, basically a couple of guys with no resources to their name at all. And their business model was basically buying up the pedal licenses for next to nothing. It cost them basically a couple of thousand pounds for each license when they bought it. They're basically just trying to talk those up, try and get test drilling applications going, try and establish the possibility that there might be quite a lot of gas down there. They're never going to do it themselves, all they do is talking up the prospects, it's a bit like giving building permission on a vacant plot of land, you can flog it on for much more than you paid for it then, and that's essentially their business model. Right? So Coast Oil and Gas haven't got resources to do any sort of significant drilling whatsoever. That's great. Yeah. So if it's like, if it's such a tough deal, If I can make such a big loss about all these, all these companies and that, um, well, I mean, why are they doing it? I mean, are they just writing it off on their tax bill or what? Well, that's part of it. I mean, Philadelphia yeah. doesn't answer. Yeah. That's partly it. I mean, as far as coastal oil and gas is concerned, I mean, they've got so little resources to actually even pursue the testing applications that what they're trying to do is they're contemplating going to the stock market as a flotation to try and draw investors in. So it's gullible investors that have basically backed the industry in most cases at the moment, and as in America, you know, they're, 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 they're finding to their cost. And yeah, if I'm not open, honest about it, I think that you know, the biggest um, prospect of this not happening in this country is not all of us kicking up the fuss about it, but the fact that the economics are very unlikely to stack up for the industry. Do you want to get Philadelphia? Yeah. 
Yes, sweetheart. Oh, yeah. um, just a quick thing. Some companies are making money off of it in the U.S., but it's it's very um, their spreadsheets are not very transparent. And um, there's an excellent economist from Texas, Deborah Rogers, who takes the industry's own data and really looks at it. And a lot of them are really on a drilling treadmill just to keep out of the red. So that and it is it's about keeping those investor dollars coming in a lot of the time. But um, some, some of them are making money, and if they, especially if they can export our gas to other countries that will pay three times as much as we do, then they'll definitely make money. But right now, um, it's part of the reason the ones that are making money can make money is because they don't have to incur the cost of water contamination, health impacts. I mean, in, in our state, the only reason they're making money is because it's totally, it's almost totally unregulated and they pay for nothing. We, the taxpayers bird, take the burden of all the costs that the industry should be paying for and if they had to incur those costs, this would most definitely absolutely not be profitable, especially the low cost of gas that we have in the U.S. right now. But just in one quick little history fact of why, because even I was like, how did this happen and how did it happen They're on a 60% tax break. That's because the reason. It really just, it's just swept across the U.S. and None of us saw it coming. If it wasn't for that film Gasland, I mean, probably it's probably still would have taken us a couple of years to realize what what was going on. But a lot of it was um, what you're talking about, which was it was a land grab. So the former um, CEO of Chesapeake um, Gas Company, Chesapeake Energy, really set off this land grab across the United States, where they were just buying leases all over the place. And other companies didn't know exactly what the hell was going on, but they were like, man, if these guys are onto something, we better get in there. And so they started buying leases too. And then once you have leases, the terms of those leases say that to hold this lease, to maintain this lease, you need to start drilling. So even before they were really ready to do it, even before the companies really were ready to do it or, or were sure it was going to be profitable, they just had to start doing it. And so literally, we have quotes from industry who were like, look, this got ahead of even the industry or the government or the regulators, you know, but we were just trying to keep up with this guy. So that is really, um, that's really how we got to this situation. I mean, it's, it's just, you know, business. And business as usual just hasn't been good to us. Paul, Paul, Paul. Thank you. Um, if you look at the founding fathers of economics, uh, Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, they all believed the economy would grow to a certain point and then stop because we'd have all the stuff we needed. When did this idea of growth start in Britain? 1954. Rabbi Berger studied in 1954 was the first time they said we've got to have more growth. What's happened is the politicians have been sold this idea that we can do this stuff, have lots of business, lots of industry, get growth, because that sounds better than the alternative, which is telling people. Sorry, the part is over. We've had 160 years of oil, and it's at a peak now, and it's on its way out. And everybody in this room, you've got three or four hundred slaves in your life, in the form of the energy supplied by fossil fuels. You don't have to do that stuff because energy does it for you. And that's going to have to change. It's not going back to the stone age. <coughs> Given the changes in technology and efficiency, we can do stuff a lot cheaper. Is that working? Yeah, there's feedback. And um, it's possible, but it's politically considered unacceptable because it means telling people, particularly rich people, uh, sorry, you can't have that anymore. Thanks. Three more questions. It was the, uh, the gentleman didn't get his question answered on council. No, state of democracy. Oh, I don't like this question. Oh, yeah, on the council incentive. Um, yeah, Hugh, Hugh asked about the, what does this say about the state of our democracy? And that's actually a really important question. Um, I, 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 when I first came across this, and I realised how bad it was, I, I, I thought to myself, well, why is everyone doing this? There are alternatives. Uh, why are they doing it? And then I, I learned some facts about what drives that. Um, I think uh, a chap called Lord John Brown has been mentioned several times. This evening. Lord John Brown is the uh, chair of Quadrilla, he's a former uh, chief executive of BP. 
Um, he's chair of Quad Driller, the company that did the fracking up in Lancashire and, and the drilling in, in Balkan. He actually works in the cabinet office. He works for the government. He's a very influential member of the government. But he has a friend called Baroness Fogg, who is the director of BT Group, which is a company involved in fracking in Australia and the USA. And she works in the Treasury. And the Treasury is the government department that is producing the guidelines for fracking in the UK and talking about tax breaks and incentives. And they're not alone. According to the Worldwide Fund for Nature, there are around 100 people like that at the heart of our government who are um, helping the government to make decisions about industries that they have an interest in. Uh, and that's not to mention Baron Howell here, the desolate North East fame, who is, uh, is actually John, uh, George Osborne's, Osborne's father-in-law. Um, so what we're, what we're suffering from is a corporate capture of our democracy. Um, we're, soon, we're very close to the point where we have no democracy, where all the decisions have been made, not by the people we elected to make decisions on our behalf, but by their friends. Uh, and I wouldn't say that anybody's getting backhanders from this, but it's all about you know, who you know within government. Uh, and that's not just limited to national government, I'm afraid. Um, unfortunately, there are a couple of councillors here this evening, and they're not going to be very happy with what I have to say, but this comes right down the line. Um, as um, I was saying earlier today, um, it's, all, it's quite easy to talk to an individual local councillor and to get that person to agree with you and say, yeah, this is really bad. But you then put that person in a room full of councillors and they have two problems. One is the party perspective on this and the other is the planning regulations. And they are constrained by planning regulations as to what they can say and what they can agree to and what they can uh, refuse to do. And, the, and then the problem is that if they refuse a planning application, the applicant just goes straight to the assembly and says, appeal, 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 and the council can't afford to challenge that because, as somebody said earlier, it's going to cost them far too much money. Thank you. So, on that, how, how can local people influence local authorities to, to stop fracking and make a stand? Do you want to take that? Yeah, well, I can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can share my experience with that with, um, in terms of the land now inquiry. Um, it's got some salutary lessons, I think, as well. Um, basically, that all started with a few concerned individuals starting to, to lobby their local councillors. And basically they were lobbying them primarily to get it, uh, any sort of planning application taken to a scrutiny committee first and foremost. Uh, and basically that can be requested by, I, th I think, any councillor uh, can take it, something to a scrutiny committee. And that was a, a cross-party committee in the Vale of Morgan. And they uh, invited all, all interested parties to make representations to them. And we won that debate comprehensively. Right. Despite the fact we had Welsh water there, we had the, 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 the oil and gas company there, we had natural resources, wilds and so on, all represented. We comprehensively won that debate with the scrutiny committee such that they took a vote in front of us at the end and unanimously voted uh, to oppose and recommend that to the planning committee that they would oppose that application. It, they then duly took that to the planning committee and I, mean, I was quite staggered actually that again, they presented our arguments forcibly enough to again the cross party uh, committee uh, voted unanimously to, re to reject the application. Um, now, this is, goes back to our democracy again. You know, we compensably won the arguments there, they voted against it, but not surprisingly, Total Oil and Gas automatically went to that to appeal, and it was overturned on the essentially a technicality that the test drilling application in itself did not directly involve fracking. No? So despite the fact it's the first stage of a process that does involve fracking, uh, if they could not, you know, the, 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 the appeal decision was to overturn the democratic unanimous verdict of the planning committee there. No? And as a result of that, uh, the Parliament Board Council was left with about £70,000 fine, no, not fine, but costs Injunction against them, and you know they got slammed. Not surprisingly, by the rest of the council for incurring that cost. As a result of that, it, it may, although we, we comprehensively with the argument with, with councillors across Wales, 
Uh, as a result of that um, decision, uh, it's, it's a very brave council that is going to uh, uh, decide to turn that uh, down a testing application. Hopefully, though, what we've managed to achieve is by engaging with them at such an early stage, winning the arguments comprehensively, uh, as and when test uh, um, uh, it goes to stage two, which does involve test fracking, you know, hopefully then they'll realise that uh, they, they have the, the ability to overturn that. Thank you. Um, yes, three more questions. Do you mind getting two of the back of and then this gentleman in front of us? Cheers. I just want to. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, most of all, this is just a list. Welcome to my address. Thanks, it's beautiful. <laughs> Love it. Do you want to push by the energy agreement that we had in 2000s? Have you had any success in taking anyone to court? Don't forget, you, you've got okay. an area of water access exemption, exemption only if you're in district. I'm going to ask three of you upstairs, yeah. so thank you very much. And this will answer that. And the other gentleman who is beside you again.
comes with the gas company saying, right, so we've given you money, we're settling, and you need to then sign this gag order or this um, non-disclosure agreement that says you'll never talk about this again. So this is, partly you haven't heard some of these stories because of, you know, the, the really, they're from rural areas and the media is lazy and owned by corporations that are also often invested in this stuff, um, but also because people literally legally can't talk about it. Um, and then, so, but that, that case in Texas was huge. Um, we also had a win in, just in December of last year in Pennsylvania. They actually tried to take away our right to zone against fracking. So some municipalities, some local areas were saying, right, you can't frack right next to this elementary school because, you know, for obvious reasons. And so the governor of the state passed a law that said, you don't have that right anymore. Actually, you can't tell the industry where they can and can't drill. And so we challenged that and we won. So, you know, what's a win and a loss <laughs> in this landscape of devastation is, is, is a bit relative. But yeah, we have, we have had some success in the courts. But what you all are doing here in trying to, you know, in not being had by them, you know, they'll say whatever they need to in the moment to get, you know, to get that next step, to do that next thing. So for you all to say, so they're like, oh, it's just testing, we're not fracking. Yeah, but this is the test you need to frack. And so for you all to, to be ahead of the game and say, right, we're not, we're not giving you an inch. Because you give them an inch and they take 10,000 miles and you can't, it's like, you know, it's like letting a vampire into your house and then thinking that that clove of garlic you've got in the kitchen is, is going to protect you. It's not. So um, and to answer the question about regula you know, regulation, it's true Pennsylvania literally has next to no regulation, but it's also true that the industry actually doesn't know, do doesn't ha know how to do this safely. There is no way to do this safely. Everywhere that they've done it in the world, there's been problems because according to the industry's own data, 5% of wells will fail immediately upon drilling. And what failure means is that the casing, the cement casing around the metal pipe that, um, that they drill, they send the drill down through, they have cement casing around that to prevent anything from leaking into the multiple layers of the earth strata that the drill goes through. Well, you know, I don't know what your sidewalks are made of, but most of our sidewalks are made of cement in the U.S., and they crack, like, the minute the tree gets a little bit bigger, the root <laughs> bursts the cement. So the five, five of the, five percent of the cement jobs fail immediately, and within 30 years, 50 percent of them fail. So, and this is stuff they discuss at industry conferences. I mean, they are trying to figure out, you know, how can we do this differently? They haven't figured it out, and we're really, really not enjoying being the guinea pigs in this situation. They cannot be done safely, and it is egregious that the United States has not forced them to prove that it's safe before this became legal. I mean, and obviously it's because Cheney had a vested interest in the gas company, so they, they don't asked. actually have to comply with any of our not being, not being her. You also asked about without chemicals. I thought she could finish about the naturally grown radioactive material. Oh, the chemicals. Oh, oh, yes, sir. Yes, the ability to delete waste system as well, so we want to save these cookies to call it. You can't get legal aid anymore. Why would anyone want to do this? So that's the future. And that's next month, we'll end with the legal aid system. So we finish there, we'll be able to find in the courts. I thought I'd just say that. Thank you, Beth. <laughs> Get them out without using those chemicals. But if they were to, to figure it out and 
not use the 300 to you know 600 different chemicals that they use in the fracking process. Um, what what is naturally occurring again in that layer of the Earth's crust is the radioactive material. So anytime you take out that gas, up with it comes what's in that layer of, of the shale, and that is not stuff that humans should be exposed to. Um, radioactive material, we all know, is, is not good for us. Um, Sorry? Do you mind when you people run up, do you mind me having I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know you we've run out of time, so I, I, I can't give you that what platform. I said very clearly, so there's no platform to speak to you. With all respect, sir. Thank you. Okay, so, what we're going to do, thank you. No, it's a... It's, a, it's a, fairness a that everybody, panel. if we gave a platform to you, we have to give it to everybody. We don't have time, sweetheart. We want a bus traveling the country. <laughs> We're going as quick as we can. With this area? Oh, yeah, actually, so that's not that big one. There is a good idea. People will be around after this, so. Yes, yeah, yeah, just individually. Yeah. Yeah. But we have to do this expediently. You're nodding me at a very negative way, which I think is really un un rather ungrateful. So, what we're going to do to finish is, if you just go quickly in one sentence, if you were going to advise people what you could see, oh. what you think would be a good thing for people to do, um, your key ask, I suppose, to help people go forward in this discussion. Just in one sentence, please, folks. In this country, you put more energy in your food, uh, as food into your face per person per year than into your house per person per year. If you really want to make a difference to your global footprint, work less, cook more. <laughs> Think about the fire and try to, try to do that. Um, I, I would say, really, education. I mean, educate yourself about you know all of these different processes, and really get involved in figuring out how your community can become um, a hundred, you know, power itself a hundred percent sustainably, and get involved with your local groups. Yeah, um, to follow on from that, I would say, you know, exactly that, that if we can't do it nationally, we certainly can do it locally, which is to create the alternatives that we want to see in the world. They're already on their way, but we can certainly, uh, at equal cost, create the alternative energy and create the energy efficiency that we need to survive and thrive. Judging by the questions tonight, which I think have been amongst the most savvy questions we've yeah. heard on the tour, you're already starting to see through the things, like we currently in Blackpool have a drill going in. We've been watching a site that's going to be active in 16 weeks for real fracking, full production. We hadn't seen that they were going to reopen the other one. And because it's a mini frack, less than two weeks notice, I get home, I've got less than 10 days and we'll have to act. You've got to watch for that, but you already are. And you're in Wales, you have some of the most active groups and active people I've seen. So I think that you're probably ahead of the game. Form a group, be a group, join a group, or just be a lone activist, you know? Okay, Andy's top tip. Uh, something you can all do, uh, very simply, is don't pay any money to the filth and frackers. Uh, switch your energy supply to a, 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 a reputable green energy supply like good energy or eco efficiency and that way you'll be denying them the funds to sort of do any fracking. Good work. Make sure all of your elected representatives at every level know how you feel about fracking and how that will influence your vote at the next election. Tax, a lovely guy, 
and he cried when he <laughs> turned up. It was just amazing to see. So, if it's okay with you, I'd love you to just hear a bit of this from our great friend Vivian Westwood, who's been brilliant during this bus tour. Okay. Um, I, how do we convince the general public that fracking is bad? Um, I would like to, to communicate to them an idea that, which is true, that David Cameron's government, our government, is very delayed and behind the times and locking us into fossil fuel energy and fossil fuel thinking and that by doing this we're going to miss out on the opportunities that other people have started to be interested in and for example um, it is going to take from 10 to 15 years before, should they be doing the test running, they will then know whether they want to continue the concession people who've got this opportunity. And so, at that point, in, in, my son Joe already talked about the insecurity that this will give for 10 and 15 years for the economy as well as for everything. And, um, and of course, stopping us from doing something about global warming. But um, after these 10 to 15 years, then what will be the price of energy in those at, at that time? Well, certainly fracking, in order to be competitive, would have to be massively subsidised because Normal fuels, meaning the ones you can get by conventional extraction, will have gone down in price. The reason being that solar energy in particular, but all the opportunities that we could have for developing alternative energy, they will be really competitive and they will be getting cheaper and cheaper. And so we're totally missing out on the opportunities to exploit and develop alternative energies. For example, just really quickly, we get nuclear energy from France. Say, for example, France was able to license some of that North Africa and get all that solar power, it would supply the whole of Europe. And they could just send that on the pipelines. Anyway, the point is we've got masses of conventional energy in the ground that we can still use that's not going to go up in price. And um, we're not allowed anyway to even use more than 20% of it because that definitely takes us into runaway climate change. And I don't want to use emotional words like in mass extinction and we're frying and all this kind of stuff, but it is crazy what the government's doing. And if that sounds crazy, well, the craziness will meet the craziness and we will have disaster. And I oh, wow, I've got one other thing to say. It, I've got this sort of maxim, which is that, um, the, that the economic crisis and the environmental crisis are the same thing. It's the same cause. Indeed, they're like two serpents that eat each, eat each other's tail. The wrong financial system has caused the energy crisis and the fact that we're, and the ecological crisis is causing the financial crisis because we're taking too much out of the earth and it's all a, a circle. And so to get out of this, it would automatically happen. I think business is going to want to do this anyway, but, the, um, sorry, What's good for the planet is good for the economy. What's bad for the planet is bad for the economy. This is the future. And it also means that what's good for the planet is good for people. What's good for people is good for the planet. 
we would get better human values. Naomi Klein is working on information that will give us the fact that should we continue in this way, we will get the world we want. Thank you. Thank you.